Yeah, that would be better. I like that. If you don't have a debt problem, you have a world. I got two. If you don't have a debt problem, I'm still Bismillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi amma ba'd. We continue reading from the book Al-Usul Al-Thalatha, the three fundamental principle. And today's class is a very important class. Today's class is a very important class. Because we always hear that we've been created to worship Allah. Naam? Is that, is that clear? Why were we created? To worship Allah. Right? And we talk about that the prophets and messengers, all of them were sent to call to Tawheed al uluhiyah right? To single out Allah in worship. However, what is worship? What is worship? Who remembers? Last week we went over the definition of worship by Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah. Does anyone recall what is the definition of worship? It's very important that we know this. They write this down. This is by Sheikh Sam Taymiyyah. Write this down. Yes, Naam, you got it? What is it? Al Ibadah. Very good. MashaAllah. You know what, too, Ahmed? What is Ibadah? Ibadah also has worship has two definitions. Naam. What is the. the go, continue. Uh, general and specific. Mm hmm. No. No. Very good. What is the second definition? No. Worship is a comprehensive term. Worship is a comprehensive term. Write this down. Al ibada, ismun jami'. It is a comprehensive term. Li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yarda. That encompasses everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. Write that down. Ibadah, worship is a comprehensive term that encompasses everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. Our entire lesson is going to be based on this one phrase. So again, Al-Ibadah, ismun jami' li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yarda. It is a comprehensive term that encompasses everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. Min al-aqwali wal-af'al. From speech and action. Al-zahir wal-batin. That which is apparent and that which is hidden. We always hear about worship, ibadah, worship. And many of us, we think worship, oh, it just means we just have to pray and dua, that's it. Not knowing that worship has, is very, very deep. And today we're going to go over some of the different types of worship. Worship is not just, okay, I just pray to Allah, that's it. That's Tawheed, that's not Tawheed. That's a form of Tawheed, but Tawheed is much deeper than that. So what is Ibadah? Who can tell me what is Ibadah? What is worship? It is a comprehensive term naam, that comprises of everything that Allah Ta'ala loves and is pleased with. From what? From statements and action that is apparent and that is hidden. طيب? And as we go along through the different types of worship, we're going to understand what is worship. طيب? Inshallah. And as we went over last week, that al what is the relationship between Tawheed al rububiyyah and Tawheed al uluhiyah Who remembers? The Tawheed of Allah's Lordship, it necessitates that we sing out Allah in His worship, right? And singling out Allah, al-iqraru bil uluhiyah yatadhamman al rububiyyah Singling out Allah in worship, this what? This what? This entails... Or it includes that a person has singled out Allah in his uh, lordship. Do we know the relationship now between Tawheed al-Rububi and Tawheed al uluhiyah Who can re- restate that to me? Naam, Ahmed. Singling out Allah in his lordship, this what? Necessitates that we single him out in worship. What does that mean? 
No. If you believe that Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth, that He created the heavens and the earth, then this necessitates that you what? You sing Him out in worship. طيب? Now, when it comes to Tawheed and Uluhi and Tawheed al Rubuya, what's the relationship between the two? Naam. Singling out Allah in worship, this what? The singling out Allah in worship, this entails or this includes that the person already what? Singles Him out in lordship. Tayyib? Tayyib. So now he goes over. He says, Ibn Kathir, he said, Al-Khaliqu li hadhi al-ashya huwa al-mustahiqu lil-ibadah. That the creator of these things, meaning the heavens and the earth, he is deserving of worship. وَأَنْوَاعُ الْعِبَادَةَ الَّتِي أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا And the different types of worship that Allah Ta'ala commands us with. The first of them being what? Al-Islam, Al-Iman, and Al-Ihsan. Yes, last week we went over the definitions of Al-Islam, Al-Iman, and Al-Ihsan. And we said these three is known as the levels of the religion. Maratib al deen right? Now he goes over وَمِنْهُ And from the different types of worship. Now we're going to go over what? Different types of worship. And remember, worship is what? Everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. From what? Statements and actions. That is apparent or that is what? Hidden. That it can be actions of the limbs or actions of the heart. Is that clear? Yes or no? Anything that Allah loves or anything that Allah commands us to do is an indication that Allah will, that Allah loves it. So that is proof that that thing is an act of worship. And that, for example, Allah Ta'ala loves that we supplicate to Him, right? So that's a proof that supplication is what? Is ibadah, is an act of worship. So it's not allowed to supplicate to anyone other than Allah. Is that clear? Allah Ta'ala loves that we sacrifice for Him, right? Right or wrong? So that is proof that sacrifice is a what? Ibadah. So sacrificing for other than Allah is shirk. We're going to go over them one by one, and it'll make more sense with the examples. So he says, and from the different types of, different acts of worship, ad-du'a, supplication. We're going to go over them one by one, don't write anything now. Al-khawf, fear. Al-raja, hope. Al-tawakkul, trust and reliance. Al-raghba, fervent desire. Al-rahba, dread. Wal-khushu' wal-khashya wal-inaba wal-isti'ana wal-isti'adha. وَالْإِسْتِغَاثَ وَالذَّبْحُ وَالنَّذْرُ وَغَيْرَ ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَنْوَاعِ الْعِبَادَةِ and all the other different types of acts of worship. The first of them is du'a, right? So first he says the proof that all acts of worship is to be only for Allah is that Allah says وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُو مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا that the places of worship is for Allah, so do not supplicate to anyone. Or worship anyone other than Allah. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمَن يَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر لا بُرْهَانَ لَهُ بِهِ فَإِنَّمَا حِسَابُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الْكَافِرُونَ That whosoever worships with other than Allah, or associates a partner with Allah in worship, another ilah that has no proof for it, then his reckoning is with Allah, and Allah does not give success to the disbelievers. This is proof that if you do any act of worship for other than Allah, then you're what? You're a mushrik. You have left the fold of Islam. Is that clear? Any act of worship. If we confirm this is an act of worship and you do it for other than Allah, then you are a what? And you die upon that. You have died upon shirk and your abode will be the hellfire for eternity. We ask Allah protection from that. So the first type of worship is dua, supplication. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ad-du'a huwa al-ibadah. Worsh, uh, supplication is worship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, call on to me and I will respond to you. Right? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ those who turn away from my worship, then they will enter into the hellfire in disgrace. Again, let me repeat that verse. Allah says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord said, supplicate to me and I will respond to you. 
Verily those who worship other than Allah or turn away from my worship, verily those who turn away from my worship, then they will enter into the hellfire for, for, uh, in disgrace. How is this proof that dua is worship? Who knows? Very good. That in this verse, Allah refers to dua as what? Worship. Allah says, call on to me, supplicate to me, right? Those who turn away from my worship. So Allah refers to dua as being what? Worship. So dua is what? Worship. So if we make dua to other than Allah, then you're what? You're a mushrik. Is that clear? So this is an indication that dua is worship. And we're going to go over each one of them. How do we know that this act of worship is worship? We can't just say anything is worship. Tayyib? There has to be proof. Tayyib, dua is two types. Dua is two types. Dua mas'ala, invocation through supplication. This is what? Supplication, asking, at-talab. It's also called dua at-talab. And the second type is dua ibadah. Supplication, I mean invocation, which is worship. So the second type of dua, meaning ibadah, this entails all acts of worship. Is that clear? Salah, dhikr, all acts of worship is what? Is dua. طيب, the dua of ibadah. However, the first type of dua, which is supplication. طيب, this is two types. The supplication, which is only for Allah. Or the asking, or the requesting, which is only for Allah. This supplication, or this asking, it comprises of humility and submission to the one who you're asking. This is worship. And it's only for Allah. Humility and submission. This is what? Supplication or asking or requesting. The second type of dua al-mas'ala is when it comes to the creation. If you're asking someone or calling on to someone or making a request from someone, and you're asking him for something that he is capable of doing. For example, you ask someone, can you help me pick up this book? He can hear you, he is present. He is capable of doing that what you're asking him. Is this shirk? No, this is permissible. Is that clear? Yes. Now if you're asking someone something that only Allah is capable of doing, that is shirk. For example, you ask someone, can you please send down rain from the heavens? Why is that shirk? Because only Allah is capable of sending down rain from the heavens. Is that clear? Or if you ask someone, can you please enter me into Jannah? That is shirk. Why? Because only Allah Ta'ala, He is the one who enters the people into paradise. Is that clear? So if you ask someone something or make, an, uh, make a request of something that he is capable of doing and he can hear you, he's in front of you. طيب, that is not shirk. You ask someone, can you please help me? Can you please feed me? Right? That is not shirk. Now I have a question. What if you ask the dead, can you please feed me? What, no, no. what if you ask the alive, someone who's in front of you, can you please feed me? He's capable of feeding you. Tayyib? He's in front of you. He can hear you. Is this shirk? No. That is permissible. Now what if you ask the dead the same question, can you please feed me? Is that shirk? That is shirk. Why is that shirk? Who can tell me? Huh? Naam, he can't. That's very good. One reason, he cannot hear you. He's not present. Is that clear? Another reason is that, that you're asking him because you believe that he has some sort of tasarruf ful kawn, that he has some sort of control of the affairs in the universe. Is that clear? When who is the one who only has control of the affairs? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that clear or no? So dua is divided into how many categories? Two. 
Dua mas'ala, right? Which is supplication, which is what? Asking. This is divided into further two categories. What are the two categories? Dua mas'ala, which is ibadah, which is supplication. And this ibadah, it consists or it comprises of what? At-tadallul wal khudu' submission and humility to the one who you're calling out to. This is only for Allah. The second type of dua mas'ala is that you're asking, you're making a request of someone. Right? If you're asking someone something that he is capable of doing, he can hear you, he can see you, this is, there's no issue with that. You ask someone, can you please feed me? طيب? Can you please help me? He can hear you. Now if you're asking someone something that only Allah Ta'ala is capable of doing, such as you're asking, can you please send down rain from the heavens? This is what? Shirk. Or if you ask the dead, can you please feed me? This is what? Shirk. Because you're asking the dead, this entails that you believe that the dead has tasarruf fil kawn. He has control over the affairs in the what? In the heavens and the earth. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has control over the affairs in the heavens and the earth. Tayyim. Write this down. Ad dua When it comes to the answering of the dua, one of three matters take place. One of three matters, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He responds to the supplication. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Right? Your Lord said, call unto me, I will respond to you. Allah Ta'ala promises that He will what? Respond. And this is a wa'ad from Allah. Tayyib? Likewise, when Allah commands us to do something, this is an indication that it's what? When Allah commands us to do something, it's an indication that it's what? It's an ibadah. It's a worship. Why? Because Allah only commands us something that He loves. Is that clear? Because we want to know, what is the proof that this is an act of worship? And the author in the book, he proposes different types of proof to prove a certain act of worship is an act of worship. As we go through them, it will make more sense inshallah. So when it comes to the responding of the dua, Allah responds to the dua in three ways. Number one, that Allah Ta'ala will give the person what he's asking for in the dunya. For example, if you make dua to Allah, Oh Allah, give me a car, Allah responds and He gives the person a car. Number two, أو ادخار ذلك في الآخرة Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the person the thing in the hereafter. That Allah will give him in what? In the hereafter. And know that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a person in the hereafter, it is far beyond what the mind can conceive of. Because in Jannah is what no eye has ever seen, what no ear has ever heard, or what no mind has ever thought of. It's far beyond what you can imagine. طيب. Number three, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove away from him an evil that is in accordance to what he called to. Meaning, that he made dua for a certain thing, and instead of giving him what he wanted, Allah ta'ala removed away from him an evil that he was going to encounter. Is that clear? That number three, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to him by removing away from him an evil. To protect him from an evil that he was going to encounter. And all of this is from the complete knowledge and wisdom of Allah. Tayyib. When it comes to the conditions of dua, write this down. There are six conditions. Six conditions to dua. Tayyip, which dua are we talking about? Dua mas'ala or dua talab? Dua mas'ala, right? Dua meaning supplication. There are six conditions. Number one. 
ikhlas dua lillah that the dua is done sincerely to Allah sincerity that's the first condition number 2 al yaqeen bil ijaba certainty in the answering that the person has no doubt that Allah Ta'ala will respond to him. He has certainty. Is that clear? That when you have dua, when you make dua, you have certainty that Allah Ta'ala will respond to you. You don't have any doubt. Number three, Allah yakuna dua bi ithmin. That the supplication, you're not supplicating. For something that is a sin. For example, if someone were to supplicate to Allah, asking to cut ties with his parents, is that permissible? No, because cutting ties with your parents is what? Is a sin. Number four, Adamul Ajala. Not being hasty in the response. That he is patient when he, makes, when he supplicates for the answer. Because Allah Ta'ala, He commands and He responds to the dua when He sees a fit. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He said, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَعْجَلْ That Allah will respond to your supplication as long as the servant is not hasty in the response. يَقُولْ دَعَوْتُ فَلَمْ يَسْتَجِبْ لِي The person will say, I made dua, I made dua, and Allah never answered me. He is being what? Hasty. So from the conditions of dua is that the person is not hasty in the response. Number five, عَدَمُ الْعِتِدَاءِ فِي الدُّعَاءِ That the person does not transgress the boundaries in dua. That he does not transgress what? The boundaries in dua. An example of that the shaykh gives is that the person says, Oh Allah, give me the highest level in Jannah. Is that permissible? That's not permissible. Why? Because the highest level in Jannah is for the prophets and the messengers. So you're transgressing the boundaries of a dua. Meaning that you want a higher level than the prophets and the messengers. Naam? Meaning give me the, high, the highest level, A, eh? over the prophets and the messengers. You're transgressing boundaries. Is that clear? As for saying, oh Allah, make me with the prophets and the messengers, then there's no problem with that. Number six, طيب المتاع من مأكل ومشرب وملبس ومسكن The sixth condition is that the person, his food, his clothing, and his drink is from halal. Meaning that his income is not from what? Haram. Whether it is from riba, or alcohol, or stealing, or cheating, so on and so forth. Who knows the hadith, the proof, that from the conditions of Allah Ta'ala to respond to the dua, that his income is what? Is halal. Who can give me a proof of that? Who knows the hadith? Anyone know the hadith of the man traveling? Naam. No, it's in, it's in the 40 hadith of Nawi, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a man will travel, ash'ath aghbar, that a man is traveling, disheveled, his hair is all over the place, he's in the middle of traveling, his clothes are sandy, he raises his hands to the heavens. He's coming with all the means of what? For Allah to answer the supplication. He raises his hands to the heavens. He's a traveler. He's in going through difficulty. And he says, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. He's screaming out, Oh Allah, oh, oh my Lord, oh my Lord. All of this, he came with the means for what? For Allah to respond to the supplication. However, the Prophet said, But his food is from haram. His drink is from haram. His income is from haram. So how can Allah respond to him? Showing that from the conditions is that 
the person's income is halal. However, do we say that Allah never responds to a person who has a haram income? No. We don't say never. But it's very what? Unlikely. Naam. Likewise, from the etiquettes of dua, is that the person, he faces the qibla, and he raises his hand when he makes dua. These are from the etiquettes of dua. He faces the qibla, and he raises his hand. And through difficult times, the Prophet ﷺ, such as in war and battle, he would raise his hands high. Likewise, the times when dua is most likely to be responded to or answered. Number one is between the adhan and the iqama. That time is a blessed time. These are timings when the dua is answered. More likely than others. Number one is between the adhan and the iqama. Number two is immediately after the adhan. Do you know the difference between that? Between the adhan and the qam and immediately after the adhan. It's a sunnah many people left off. Number three, a safar traveling. Number four, in the nuzul al matar, when rain, when it's raining. Number five, the day of Jum'ah, when the khatib is giving the khutbah as he's sitting between the khutbatain. Do you know when you're listening to the khutbah and the khatib, the one who's giving the, the, the khutbah, he sits down? At that time, the person should make dua, but without raising his hand and without being loud. Is that clear? Likewise, the day of Jum'ah, some of the ulama, they say on Jum'ah before Maghrib, the arrow before Maghrib. What number are we on? Seven? Seven? Number eight. In sujood. That when the person is in sujood, that is the closest time he is with Allah. Who can give me one more? One more. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heavens. The hadith. The last third of the night. The last third of the night. Tayyib, quick recap. Dua is how many types? Two. two. What are the two types of dua? Huh? Dua ibadah, which is what? In, no, dua ibadah is all acts of worship. All acts of worship is what? Dua. As the Prophet says, dua hu al ibadah. Dua is ibadah. Salah, zakah, all of these different acts of worship where the person is seeking by it the reward of Allah. And seeking by the protection from his punishment, all of this is what? Is dua. Tayyib? The second type of dua is what? Dua al mas'ala. Right? Dua of supplication, asking, requesting. And we said this is likewise divided into two categories. Do you guys remember or no? That which is specific for Allah. And we said, what does that comprise of? That the person is what? It comprises of humility and submission to Allah. This is specific for what? For Allah. And then we have the second type of dua, asking or making a request, and that is permissible for what? For the creation. And that is a person makes a request to someone in something that he is capable of doing, and he can hear you. He can hear you. He can see you. Tayyib, nowadays, you know, See you, meaning what? He's alive. Tayyib? Or you can call him, make a request. He's capable of doing that. Can you please help me You know, pay the rent? Is this allowed? Yes. What if you ask someone in the dead, can you please help me pay the rent? No, that is not allowed. Why? Why is that not allowed? Because he's not present, he cannot hear you. And what else? He's not able to. Because you believe that that person in the grave can what? He has control over affairs and what? 
in the heavens and the earth. Is that clear? So that is shirk. Tayyib. Next act of worship. And what is the proof that dua is worship? What is the proof? The, the, had, the ayah, right? Where Allah refers to dua as being worship. Likewise, the hadith. What is the hadith? Dua huwa al-ibad. Dua is worship. Right? Number two, the second type of worship, fear. Fear is another act of worship. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِي إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not fear them and fear me if you are true believers. طيب. How do we know that fear is an act of worship? Do we just say anything is an act of worship? No. How do we know that fear is an act of worship? Allah says, Do not fear them and fear me if you are true believers. Because Allah commands us to do it. Right? And Allah only commands us to do something that what? That He loves. So fear is an act of worship. What type of worship is it? It is the worship, ibadah qalbiyya, from the acts of worship from the heart. Write this down. Fear is four types. Fear is four types. Guys, this is a very important class. Going over the different acts of worship. This is, this is the, the, the core of Usul al Thalatha. Fear is four types. The first type, Al Khawf al Tabi'i, the fear which is natural. And that is to fear something like a snake or to fear a lion. Or to fear someone who has a weapon. This fear is natural. Is it permissible? Yes. The fear which is natural is permissible. And it does not impact your iman. It has no effect on your iman. Tayyib? However, the second type of fear is fear al-khawf, which is muharram, which is haram, prohibited. And that is to fear something that makes you fall into a sin. Meaning you fear something, so you end up falling into a sin, or you leave off a prohibition. This is the second type of fear. Fear which is prohibited, haram. For an example... If you work and you're scared of your boss, that if you pray, she's going to fire you. So you stop praying. Is that fear tabi'i, natural, or fear that is muharram? Fear that is muharram. Same thing with the beard. You fear what people are going to say. This is fear that is muharram. In most cases, this type of fear is from shaitan. The whispers of shaitan. He threatens the person. If you worship Allah, this and that will take place. You will be harmed. If you worship Allah, this and that will take place. This is from the whispers of shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, الشَّيْطَانُ يَعِدُكُمُ الْفَقْرُ الْفَقْرُ وَيَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ Shaytan, He instills fear of poverty in your heart. And He commands you to evil. So how does He command you to evil? By instilling what? Fear of poverty in your heart. So he says, don't give charity. Don't go do this. Don't go to the masjid. Otherwise you're going to lose your job. Don't pray, you're going to lose. All of this is from who? Shaitan. Naam. I gotta get the exact ayah for you. <laughs> I'll get you the ayah right now. Fikum ash-shaytanu ya'idukum so Allah says, Shaytan, He places fear of poverty in you and commands you to evil. Wallahu ya'idukum maghfira min wa fadla. And Allah promises for you His forgiveness and His bounties. 
Naam. So this ayah is in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 268. So one of the tactics of shaitan is he instills what? Fear. Tayyib, does, does this type of fear, does it negate iman and tawheed? Who knows? If you fear someone or something, so you end up falling into a prohibition, does this negate tawheed completely or does it negate the completion of tawheed? The completion of tawheed. Very good. So it's a sin, meaning your iman is what? Low. It does not negate tawheed completely. Because this fear is not ibadah. This is not the fear of worship. Is that clear? Naam. So if you do this, if you leave off an obligation, or if you fall into a sin because you fear someone or something, then this is an indication of the negation of the completion of tawheed in your heart and iman. So this is an uh, indication of deficiency in your iman. Is that clear? The person is still what? Muslim. He still has iman. But his iman is deficient. The third type of fear, which is fear al-ibadah. Fear that is worship. And this fear is only for Allah. This fear is only for Allah. وَيَتَضَمَّنْ الْخُضُوعُ وَالتَّذَلُّلُ And it comprises of submission and humility to the one whom you fear, which is Allah. And this fear, the fear of Allah, it can be destructive or it can be productive. How can it be destructive? It can be destructive if the person fears Allah so much that he despairs from the mercy of Allah. He goes extreme in fear. Someone goes extreme in fear. And these are the traits of the khawarij. However, the fear that is productive is the fear that stops the person from committing sin. And he balances it with hope. And the hope in the mercy of Allah. So the fear that is productive, it is the fear of Allah standing the day when you will stand before Allah, fearing the day when you will stand before Allah, fearing the hellfire, fearing the grave. This fear should encourage the person to stay away from the prohibitions and fulfill the obligations. This is the productive fear. The praiseworthy fear. This is the fear of Allah that will cause the person to enter into Jannah. May Allah make us from them. This is fear that is followed up with what? Action. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ As for the one who fears the standing before his Lord, so he restrains himself from his desires. You see, he feared Allah, so what did he do? He restrained himself from his desires. Allah says, فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ Paradise is his abode. May Allah make us from them. Now the fourth type of fear. And this type of fear is very important to understand. وَهُوَ الْخَوْفَ asir, The secret superstitious, superstitious fear. And this is for an example, a person who fears that someone in the grave can harm you. Or the dead, or an idol, or anyone other than Allah, the dead, can harm you. So you fear them. This is the secret superstitious fear. And at the time of the Prophet sallallahu even today, even some of the Muslims, those who go extreme from a Sufiya, 
you see that they, in, that they indulge in this type of fear. They fear the awliya who are dead. So much so that there's a man by the name of So much so that there's a man from the head of the Sufiya who's an evil man. His name is Al Bedawi, who's in Egypt. Tayyib, this man, a lot of the Sufiya and those who have gone astray from the Muslims, when they pass by his grave, they begin to tremble, fearing that he's going to do something to them. Is that clear? Naam. Everything okay over there with the Tayyib. So this type of fear is what? Fearing the effects of the people or someone who is dead. Tayyib, you fear that he can harm you, such as the awliya. So even some of the Muslim lands, you see that it was narrated from one of the books of the ulama that uh, when um, in Egypt, one of, one of the, the, the kids, he came up to a student of knowledge. This is in the book of Sheikh Salah al-Sheikh. He mentions this story. He said that one of the kids, he came to one of the students of knowledge, he said, please give me wealth, charity, he's poor. So he gave him some currency, some wealth. And the kid said, I ask you by Al-Bedawi, give me more. I ask you by who? Al-Bedawi, the dead, the wali. This is a Muslim. What does that mean? Why is he saying, I ask you by Al-Bedawi? Meaning that if you don't give me, he's going to come to you. He's going to harm you. Is that clear? This is how they would do many of the what? The extreme of the Sufis. When it comes to their walis, their awliya. And then the student of knowledge, he said, okay, give me. Give me the wealth. So I can, he thought that he was going to give him, so he could give him more. He took the money, he said, I'm not giving you anything. You just, made, you just committed shirk. <laughs> so is this, what is this shirk called? What type of shirk is this? What type of khawf? Superstitious. Superstitious fear. Or secret fear. The, fe- the secret fear, which is called a shirk uh, Al-Khawf As-Sir. Naam. Tayyib, the next act of worship. Tayyib, and how do we know that fear is an act of worship? Because Allah commands us to fear Him. Indicating that Allah loves when we fear Him. So if Allah loves it, then that means it's a what? It's an act of worship. And fear is from the acts of worship that are pertaining to what? The qalb, the heart. Is that clear? So how many categories of fear are there? Four. What are the four categories? Um, natural. The natural. No, the natural, the prohibited fear, fear of ibadah, fear of ibadah. And super fear. the superstitious fear. Likewise, Muhammad al Jami he mentions in his book a story as well. When it comes to a lot of the 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 awliya, especially when you see in like the more third world countries where the Muslims are. They go in front of their wali. They go in front of their wali. They lay down like their dogs, trembling. This is someone who's what? Not only the dead, fearing the one who's what? Alive. A wali. Why are they scared? They're scared that he's going to see what's in their heart. He's going to know what they're thinking. So they're what? They're trembling. This type of fear also is what? Shirk. Is that clear? This type of fear is also what? Shirk as-sir. It's from the categories of shirk as-sir. Uh, khawf as-sir. Tayyib, the next act of worship. Ar-raja. Hoping and longing. Having hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says about hope. فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا That whosoever hopes to meet his Lord, then let him do righteous actions. وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا 
and let him not associate any partners with Allah. Where is the evidence that hope is ibadah here? Allah says, whoever hopes to meet his Lord. Hope is the action. Indicating that Allah Ta'ala loves when the person what? Hopes to meet his Lord. Indicating that hope is what? Something that Allah loves, so it is an act of worship. Ar-Raja. And Ar-Raja, hope, is that a person, he has hope and he wishes for something that may be attained and is close. He wishes for something to be what? That he can attain. That may be attained and it is what? Close. Or it may be far, but he treats it as, it's, as if it is close. He wishes for the thing. And the raja, which is ibadah, which is worship, it is the, the raja, the hope, which comprises of wal khudu' submission and humility, and placing your complete trust in Allah is worship. And this hope, is only for Allah. Likewise, Raja, the second type of Raja is Ar Raja al Tabi'i, having hope, a natural hope. For example, if you ask someone, I hope you can help me today. I hope you can what? Help me pick up this rock. Is this shirk? Is this shirk or no? No. Why is this not shirk? Because he's present, he can hear you, and he's what? He's capable of doing that which you hope. Now what if you say, I hope you can enter me into Jannah. Is this shirk? Naam. Why is this shirk? Because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's able to enter the person into Jannah. What if you say, I hope you can send down the rain today. Is this shirk? Yeah. Naam. Why? Because only Allah Ta'ala is the one who is able to send down the rain. Oh. Now when it comes to those in the grave, having hope in anything, when it comes to the people in the grave, is shirk as well. What if you have hope for someone in the grave to feed you today? Is this shirk? Why is this shirk? Because this entails that you believe that those in the grave have what? Have tasarruf al kawn. They have some sort of affair or control. That's what's happening in the universe. Tayyib. No. The second what? Raja, which is natural. No. So if you hope that someone does something that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of doing, this is what? Shirk. Whether it is someone who is alive or someone who is dead. If you're hoping in someone that is alive or someone that is dead. Is that clear? Naam. The, the raja, which is ibadah, is only for Allah. The Raja, which is ibadah, which is worship. Tayyib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ So whosoever hopes to meet his Lord. Again, indicating that hope is what? An act of worship. And what type of act of worship is it? Is it from the body parts or the heart? The heart. It's from the acts of worship from the heart. فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Then let him do righteous actions. Indicating that hope is followed by action. Hoping for the mercy of Allah is followed by what? Righteous action. As for the person who has hope for the mercy of Allah, and he says everything is in the heart, as long as my heart is pure, and he does sins, this is ghurur. He's deceiving himself. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Al-kayyisu mandana nafsah, wa amila lima ba'da al-mawt. 
The Prophet said, the wise one is the one who prohibits himself or restricts himself and works for after death. He works for what? For after death. Meaning he does what? Righteous actions. Wal-ajiz. As for the deficient person, man ittaba'a nafsahu hawaha, who just follows his desires, wa tamanna ala Allah. And he has hope in Allah. He commits sin, 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 and he says what? Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. This is the one who is what? Hope in the mercy of Allah is followed by what? As Allah says, whoever has hope to meet his Lord, then let him do what? Then do righteous actions. Followed by what? Righteous actions. So, hope in Allah, in the mercy of Allah, is two types, which is praiseworthy. Number one, the one who does a righteous action and he hopes for Allah to accept it. This is the first type of what? Hope in the mercy of Allah. He does a righteous action and he follows it up by what? Hope that Allah accepts that righteous action. Number two, مَنْ تَابَ وَرَجَى قُبُولَ تَوْبَتِهِ The one who commits a sin and then he repents, and he has hope that Allah Ta'ala forgave him for his sin. Number two, the one who commits a sin, and then he repented to Allah, and he has hope that Allah Ta'ala forgave him for his sin. The third type of hope is غرور, is deception. The one who just commits sin, 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 and has hope. Followed by all sin with no action. طيب, is that clear so far? Clear? Let's go to the next act of worship. التوكل To place your trust and your reliance in Allah. التوكل Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Placing your reliance in Allah, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ And place your trust and your reliance in Allah if you are true believers. So how do we know that placing our trust and our dependency and our reliance in Allah is an act of worship? Because it's a command indicating that Allah what? Loves it, so it is an act of worship. And it is from al-ibad al qalbiya It is from the acts of worship that pertain to what? To the heart. Likewise, placing your trust in Allah is a condition for iman. Is a condition for what? Iman. This is what the ulama say. As this ayah says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا Then place your trust in Allah if you are believers. Showing that placing your dependence and your reliance in Allah is a what? A condition of iman. And it is from the completion of iman that the person places his reliance and his trust in all of his affairs in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, that's more fiqh. No. <laughs> طيب. So, what is tawakkul? Likewise, Allah says, وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ And whoever places his dependency and his reliance on Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him. Allah will suffice him. Now, how do we know that placing your trust and your reliance on Allah is an act of worship? Because it is a what? A command indicating that Allah Ta'ala loves it. Tayyib. Shaykh Uthaymin, he says, what is a tawakkul Write this down. A tawakkul the definition of a tawakkul huwa al-i'timadu ala Allahi kifayatan wa hasba. It is to... Re- uh, Naam. Wa ala Allahi fatawakkalu. And place your trust in Allah. This is indicating that Allah loves it. Naam? I heard the second version, so I, but I see that. 
The second verse, Allah says, وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَىٰ And whoever places his trust in Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him or suffices him. This is a proof that Allah what? loves when the person places his trust in Allah. Naam. So because Allah loves it, then it is what? It is an act of worship. Naam. Tayyib, what is at tawakkul? What is the definition of at tawakkul? Shaykh Uthaymin, he says, at tawakkul huwa li'itimadu ala Allah ta'ala kifayatan wa hasba fi jalb al-manafi' wa daf' al-madar. At tawakkul, it is to place your reliance and your dependency on Allah. Believing and accepting that He is sufficient and He will suffice you. In attaining or obtaining that which is beneficial in obtaining that which is beneficial and protecting you from that which is harmful. So what is a tawakkul? It is to place your reliance and your dependency on Allah. Believing that Allah Ta'ala is what? That He will suffice you. In what? In obtaining that which is beneficial and to protect you from that which is harmful. And we will add another portion that many of the ulama say, al-asbab, while taking the legislated means. While taking the legislated means. So we all have tawakkul in Allah, that Allah Ta'ala, He is a razzaq na'am, that He will provide for us. However, while we have this trust in Allah that Allah will provide for us, does that mean we just sit home and we do nothing? No, we take those legislated means and then we place our trust in Allah. Is that clear? As for the person who just has trust in Allah while not taking the legislated means, this is a form of ghurur, another form of deception. He's deceiving himself. And as Shaykh Uthaymin, he says, وَإِذَا صَدَقَ الْعَبْدُ فِي اعْتِمَادِهِ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى كَفَاهُ اللَّهِ And whoever is truthful in placing his dependency and his trust in Allah, then Allah Ta'ala will protect him and take care of him. As Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, and whoever places his reliance and his dependency in Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him. And then look, he gives comfort to the believer when he says in the next ayah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِهِ Verily, Allah Ta'ala will bring about His decree. Verily, Allah will what? Will bring about His decree. What does that mean? That all of the affairs are in the hands of Allah. Whatever Allah decrees will take place. No matter if the entire creation came together to stop it. So the believer places his trust in Allah. Verily, whatever Allah decreed will take place. Because all of the affairs are in the hands of who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huh? The statement of Shaykh Uthaymin, he says, whoever is truthful in placing his trust in Allah, then Allah will protect him and take care of him. As Allah says, and whoever places his trust in Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him. And then Allah Ta'ala, he gives a form of comfort to the believers in the next ayah. What does he say? إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِهِ Verily Allah Ta'ala will bring about His decree. Meaning His decree will inevitably what? Take place. Whatever Allah wills, no one in the heavens and the earth can stop it. And whatever Allah Ta'ala does not will, no one can make it happen. Is that clear? No. At tawakkul is four types. Write this down. Placing our trust in Allah is four types. Number one, the tawakkul which is worship. The tawakkul which is what? Worship. And this tawakkul is that the person places his complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
in obtaining that which is beneficial and protecting him from that which is harmful. And this tawakkul again is followed by taking the legislated means. Tayyip, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لَوْ تَوَكَّلْتُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ حَقَّ التَّوَكُّلِهِ لَرَزَقَكُمْ كَمَا يَرْزُقُ الطَّيْرِ تَغْدُوا خِمَاصًا وَتَرَوَّحْ بِطَانًا Rawahu Ahmad. The Prophet said, if you placed your trust the way in Allah, the way He ought to be trusted, then Allah Ta'ala will feed you and provide for you the same way that He provides for the birds. That the birds they leave out in the morning empty stomach and they return home full. And as we know, the ulama, they say, what does this mean? Showing the importance of what? Going out and seeking your provision. Taking the legislated means. Because as we know that the birds, do they just sit in their nest all day? No, they go out and they seek for their provision. The second type of tawakkul is a tawakkul asir. The secret uh, superstitious to, uh, trust or dependency. The same thing as what? As the khawf. You guys remember or no? What does this mean? He says, Shaykh Uthaymin, أي أن يتوكل السر بأن يعتمد على ميت في جلب المنفعة أو دفع مضرة. That the person, he places his trust in the dead. In obtaining that which is good or protecting him from that which is harmful. And this is, let me just make this last point. As the ulama, what is, what, what is a tawakkul as-sir? That the person, he places his trust in who? Similar to the person who places his trust in the dead. The person who places his trust in the dead. Why is this shirk? Why is this shirk? If the person places his trust in the Prophet Muhammad... Why is this shirk? Why? If the person places his trust in Jibreel, if the person places his trust in the prophets and messengers, why is this shirk? Very good. That the person is not able to do that which you want from him. From protecting you or benefiting you. Because by you placing your trust in someone who is dead, that means that you believe that he has what? Tasarruf fil kawn. That he has control over the affairs in the heavens and the earth. Or in the universe. Is that clear? So this is a tawakkul asir. The secret superstitious dependency. The third type of tawakkul is... It? The third type of tawakkul is to place your trust in someone other than Allah in something that they do have control in. I'll, I'll, I'll explain right now. Is to place your dependency and your trust. For example, a human being, you place your dependency in him. In something that he has control in. While feeling that he is in a higher standard of you. And that you are in a lower standard. For an example... Your boss in work, you depend on him for what? You depend on him for what? Provision, right? If you depend on him for provision, while feeling that he is of a higher standard and you feel you yourself are very low, then this is a form of sh- lower shirk, minor shirk. Because your heart is attached due to your strong attachment to him. And your dependency in him. Is that clear? Meaning that you place your dependency on him with what? With humility. However, if you place your dependency on him for a salary, while believing that he is only a means, and Allah Ta'ala, he is the one who provides for you through him, then there is nothing wrong with that. Is that clear? That you depend on him for a salary or some sort of risk. While believing that Allah, He is Al Musabbab, He is the one who what? Who provides for you. And that your CEO or your owner is only a what? A means for your provision. Then there's nothing wrong with that. And Allah Ta'ala is providing for you through Him. Is that clear? 
For an example, if someone is sick, if someone is sick and he goes to the doctor and he sees the doctor as if the doctor is what? Way above him and he's lower. He says, please help me, please help me. Ya na'am? And he puts himself low with humility. Then this can be a form of minor shirk. Why? Because your heart is so attached to him. Due to the strong attachment of your heart to him. Whereas the mu'min, if you believe that doctor is only a means for your shifa, for your cure. And Allah Ta'ala, your cure is in the hands of Allah. So your heart is not dependent on who? On the doctor. But your heart is dependent upon what? Allah. And you only see the doctor as what? Your milia means. I don't place my trust in the doctor. But going to the doctor is from what? Is from taking the legislative means. So you have to take the legislative means, but you don't place your trust in the legislative means. You place your trust in Allah. Because Allah Ta'ala, He is the one who is in control of all the fears. Is that clear? Tayyip, the last form of, shi- uh, of, of, of tawakkul is that you entrust someone. You entrust someone. You entrust someone to act on your behalf with something. For example, if you have a store and you, have, you put someone who's in charge, you entrust him to run the store. Tayyip, this is what? This is from the tawakkul, that is what? There is nothing wrong with it. Is that clear? You entrust someone to do something on your behalf. Sending someone to do something. Tayyim, there's nothing wrong with that. So how many types of tawakkul are there? Four. What are the four types of tawakkul? What is the first type of tawakkul? The, f- the first type of tawakkul, which is what? Ibadah. Worship. And this is the tawakkul that comprises of what? Humility and submission to the one whom you're placing your trust in. And you believe that he is in control of all the affairs. What is the second type of tawakkul? When you're dependent upon what? The superstitious secret dependency. What is that? Placing your trust in someone who's what? Who's in the grave. It's similar to someone who what? You place your trust to someone who is in the grave. And also another story that uh, Muhammad Amal Jami, he mentions in his book. I believe it's Muhammad Amal Jami in his Sharh or Salih al Sheikh. I'm not sure which one. But one of them. They mention in their book that the, the, the Sufiya, from the extreme of the Sufiya, likewise, their awliya. What do they say to their people? They say, when you're going through difficulty, mention my name. When you're going through difficulty, what? Mention my name. Replace your trust in me. Wal-iyadu billah. Tayyib, keep mentioning my name. Keep mentioning my name. And you see this. You go to a lot of parts of the world where they go through difficulty, they start mentioning a name. They're placing their trust in what? In the wali. And there are many Muslims who do this. Is that clear? So what is the third type of tawakkul? Placing your dependency upon what? Someone from the creation who is what? He has control of the thing. However, you look at him as he has a what? He has a higher standing and you are what? Of lower standing. And you go to him with what? With humility. Naam? And your heart is attached to him. That's an important condition. Your heart is what? Attached to him. We see a lot of this with what? A lot of Muslims do this. Naam? Their heart is attached to who? To the doctor. Their heart is attached to their CEO. Their heart is attached to their owner. Whereas the mu'min, his heart is attached to who? Only Allah. Your doctor, your CEO, all of these other things, they are only what? Means. Whereas Allah, He is in control of your provision. Is that clear? So at-tawakkul is what? From the greatest forms of ibadah. One of the greatest forms of worship. And as we said, it is a condition of what? Iman. As Allah says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا in kuntum mu'minin. So place your trust in Allah if you are true believers. And the last tawakkul is that you entrust someone in some affair on your behalf, such as if you have a store or something, you have someone who is like a wakil, someone who is in control of that. Tayyib, we'll stop here. And inshallah, because it's, we went over a lot, Tayyib, 
And next week we want to we want to finish over the next acts of worship. Let him make adhan, and then after adhan we'll do a quick recap, a quick a quick review, inshallah. Let's do a quick recap. So from the very beginning, the first question, what is ibadah? This entire lesson is based on ibadah. What is ibadah? The definition of Sheikh Islam bin Taymiyyah. Who can tell me? Inshallah by next week we can have everyone memorize it in Arabic. Who can tell me what is ibadah? Ibadah is a comprehensive term that comprises everything that Allah loves and is pleased with from statement and action that which is apparent and that which is hidden. So anything that Allah commands us within the Quran is what? Is Ibadah. And anything that Allah Ta'ala for example, He commands us to do or anything that Allah Ta'ala praises in the Quran is what? Ibadah. Even if Allah doesn't command us to do it, if He what? If He praises it as being a good quality of a believer, it is what? Ibadah. Why? Because Allah Ta'ala loves it. Is that clear? The first Ibadah or act of Ibadah that the, the Shaykh goes over is a dua Tayyib, before we go, go through that, if anyone commits any act of worship to other than Allah, then he has committed major shirk. And his abode, if he dies upon that, is what? The hellfire for eternity. May Allah protect us from that. So what is the first act of ibadah that the author goes over? Who remembers? Dua. Tayyib. And we said dua is how many types? Two. Two types. What is the two types of dua? Huh? Dua which is supplication, dua al-mas'ala, and dua which is ibadah. Dua which is worship. Meaning all acts of worship. Now the dua which is supplication, that is divine to how many types? Two. That which is only for Allah, and that comprises of what? Submission and humility to Allah. This is ibadah. Placing your trust in Him. This is only for Allah. The second type is that when it comes to the creation, you ask them for something. And they are capable to do that which you're asking them to do. They are in front of you. They can hear you. You say, can you please help me pick up this rock? Can you please feed me? Is this shirk? Is this shirk or no? No. What if you ask him, can you please send down rain from the heavens? That's shirk. Why? Because you're asking him to do something that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. But what if you ask someone in the dead, can you please feed me? Is that shirk? Yes. Why is that shirk? Because you believe that that person in the grave can what? Has tasarruf, has some sort of control in the universe. When only Allah Ta'ala, He alone is in control of the heavens and the earth. Is that clear? Tayyib, we said ibadah. Ibadah, when it comes to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala answering the dua. How many categories is it? Three. What are the three categories? Naam. 
that Allah will give the person what they ask for in the dunya. You ask Allah for a car, He gives it to you in the dunya. You ask Allah to cure you, He gives it to you. He cures you. What is the second type? Naam. That Allah gives it to them in the hereafter. Tayyib, what is the third type? Naam. Continue, continue. Bilal. That He removes the evil from that person or He protects him from the evil that he was going to encounter. Is that clear? In accordance to what he asked for. Is that clear? Tayyip, what are the conditions of dua? We said how many conditions are there? Six. six. What are the six conditions? Number one is what? That the dua is done sincerely, that the dua is done sincerely for Allah. Number two? Certainty, in the Certainty that Allah will answer your dua. Having no what? Doubt. Saying, yeah, I asked Allah but I don't know. No. You ask Allah and you have certainty that He will respond. This is the mu'min. From his strong trust in Allah. His heart is what? Is dependent upon Allah. Number three is what? Naam. You're not supplicating for a sin. Such as if you were to ask Allah, Oh Allah, separate me from my mom and father. Is this allowed? No. Because conjoining with your parents is what? Is an obligation. And separating from them is a what? Is a sin. Or asking Allah for any sin. What is number four? Naam. Who has, who has number four? Continue, Ahmed. Do all of them. Not being hasty, Not being hasty when Allah Ta'ala, for Allah to respond to your supplication. What is the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What is the hadith of the Prophet when he said about being hasty with the answer of the supplication? Does anyone remember? Naam. No. Close. There's another the hadith the Prophet said about the one who is hasty for Allah to answer his supplication. Who remembers the hadith? What did we say? Very good. The Prophet said that Allah will respond to one of your supplication as long as the person is not hasty in the answer. The Prophet said that the person will say, Oh, I, I asked Allah, but I did not get a response. Is that clear? So not being hasty in the response is a condition. What else? Naam. That, the the that the person does not transgress the boundaries in the dua. What is an example of that? Oh, like, uh, like asking, uh... Naam, who can say? Soil. Asking Allah, oh Allah, make me in the highest level of Jannah. Why is that transgressing the boundaries? Because the prophets and the messengers, they are in the what? Highest level. Is there anything wrong with saying, Oh Allah, make me with the prophets and the messengers? No. What is number six? Condition number six? Very good. That the person, his food, his clothing, his drink, all of that is from halal income. It's from halal, not haram. What is the proof of that? Suhail? The Prophet said the man who is traveling and then he, what did he do? He's disheveled, right? His hair is all over the place. He's destitute, sandy. He's desperate. He raises his hand. He's a traveler. He's coming with all of the means for Allah to respond to his dua. Is that clear? He's meeting all the requirements, the conditions for Allah to respond. However, why did Allah not respond to his dua? His, his clothing is haram. His food is haram. His drink is haram. He's nurtured by haram. So how can Allah respond to him? However, do we say that Allah never responds to someone if he has halal in, haram income? No. It's, but it's very unlikely. Is that clear? Tayyip, what are some of the etiquettes of dua? Naam Suhail. That the person raises his hand, right? And he faces the qibla. Raise, you're raising your hand showing a form of what? That you're in what? A, a form of weakness. That you need Allah. You're begging Allah. And then the Prophet ﷺ, at times of need, he would raise them what? High. At times of desperation. Tayyib, what are some times that are more likely for Allah to respond to the dua? Besides Suhail. Musa, you have something? No. no. Who else has? What are the timings? Between what? 
between the adhan and the iqama. Very good. That's number one. Who else can tell me more? Musa. Immediately after the adhan. Very good. Who else? The traveler. Very good. What else? When it rains. Very good. All of these times we should what? Be hasty to make in dua. What else? Ahmed. The day of Jum'ah. When in the Jum'ah? One of them is the hour before Maghrib. And the other one is when? When the guy, when the khatib is giving the khutbah, when he sits down between the two khutbahs, this is a time to make what? Dua. Some of the ulama, they say, this is the, the, the dua that is not rejected. At this time, some of the ulama say. Tayyib, however, do we raise our hand during this time? No. Do we, do we make dua out loud? No. We do a secret within ourselves. Naam. Tayyib. Then we went over the next act of worship, which is what? After dua. Which is what? Fear. How many types of fear are there? Four. What are the four types of fear? Naam. Natural fear. Fear which is prohibited. What is fear which is prohibited? Fearing someone or something that causes you to fall into a sin or leave off an obligation. Who can give me an example of that? Someone fears their boss will fire him if he, if, he, if he prays, so what does he do? He doesn't pray. Or someone fears what the people will say, so what does he do? He shaves his beard. Or a woman fears what the people will say about her hijab, so what does she do? She takes off her hijab. All of this is from who? Where is this fear from? Shaitan. One of his greatest weapons is that he whispers fear, 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 so much so that the person can become paranoid. So much so that the person can become what? Paranoid. And how do we repel shaitan from his whispers? By what? Remembering Allah, right? Saying, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem. The third type of fear is what? Fear that is worship. And this is only for Allah. What is the fourth type of fear? The secret superstitious fear. What is that? Who could, besides Ahmed. What is the secret superstitious fear? Who knows? Naam. Very fearing someone that's in the grave, such as what? That he can what? That he can harm you or that he can come after you. What are some examples of this? In Egypt, they have a grave of a man by the name of Al Bedoui. Some of the Muslims over there, when they drive by him, what do they do? Tremble. They tremble, they're scared. They say, Sallim, 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 save me, save me, save me, save me. Because they're passing by his grave. Fearing that if you don't give him his rights, what is he going to do? He's going to come after you. This is what? Al-Khawf al-Sir. The secret superstitious fear. This is Shirk Akbar. It removes a person from the fold of Islam. Tayyib. And why is this Shirk Akbar? Because you believe that person in the grave can what? Can harm you. You believe that he can do something that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of. Naam. Tayyib. Uh, then we went over Raja. What is Raja? Hope and longing, right? Naam. And then we went over Tawakkul, placing your trust in Allah. And how many categories of there in Tawakkul? Four. What are the four categories? Naam, Musa. The Tawakkul, the dependency on Allah, that is worship. That's number one. Number two is what? The secret superstitious Tawakkul. What is that? Placing your trust in someone who's dead. That's an example of it, right? That you're going through difficulty and you start mentioning his name or something. The likes of this. What is number three? Placing your dependency upon the creation in something that they what? That they are capable of doing. However, you are what? You come to them and you feel they are what? In a high standard or in a higher standing and you are low. Tayyib. And you come to them with humility. And your heart has a dependency on them. This is what a form of minor shirk. The person is still Muslim. You understand? But he has deficiency in his iman. Why? Because the Muslim, he believes that his CEO, his boss, right? The doctor, all of these are what? 
asbab. They are merely means. And Allah Ta'ala, He is the one who is in control of the affairs. So do we put our heart, does our heart have some sort of reliance on the doctor? No. We look at him, you're a means, you're a sabab. But your reliance is in who? The heart is in who? With Allah. Likewise, your, your provision. Do you put your reliance, your heart is reliant and dependent upon your CEO? No, you're a sabab. Allah is the one who provides me. He provides you through that boss. But Allah Ta'ala, your risk is in the hands of Allah. Is that clear? Naam Ahmed. I got a question about this. So what if the person died upon that? Would it, would it be good, uh, transfer to the hellfire? Naam, he, 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 no, he will not enter. Shirk Asghar, Shirk Asghar, the person does not enter into the hellfire for eternity. That's only for major shirk. Naam. Tayyib, uh, what is the fourth type of tawakkul? What is the fourth type? Naam. Uh, Abu Sa'id, what is the fourth type? Entrusting someone to do something on your behalf. Like you have a, a store, right? And you say, listen, I'm entrusting you to take care of this store. Is this shirk? No. Nothing wrong with it. You're sending someone, you're entrusting someone to do something for you. There's nothing wrong with that. This is tabi'i. This is natural. Tayyib. Inshallah, we'll end the class here. And next class, we're going to go over ar ar-rahba wal khushu' wal inaba. So about five more different acts of worship. So when we say Tawheed, 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 a lot of us we think Tawheed is just prayer. Tawheed is not just prayer. Naam? Acts of worship are what? Are, are various, many different various acts of worship. And all of these acts of worship have to be solely for who? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Tawheed, understanding La ilaha illallah, is much more than we think. طيب? This is why we have to come to these types of classes so we can understand what is ibadah. So we could worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon insight. May Allah ta'ala grant us understanding in the religion. We'll stop here inshallah. Subhanakallahu alhamdulillah. Shalwallah ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiraka wa tubu alayk. Wa jazakumullahu khairan.